refresh. Yeah, I'm refreshing now. Copy of the roll. All right. Hey, everybody. I think uh, we just went live with IGT's pre-game show. <laughs> Isn't that right, <laughs> Margaret? <laughs> bye, Matt. Bye, Matt. There you are. We actually start in eight minutes, so we're setting up the live streaming right now so everybody can uh, be part of that. Um, and uh, everything to me says we're live, so that's good. So as Margaret and Tom and Rob are checking that out, I think we'll be in good shape. Now, does it look like it? Do you guys see us yet? I'm looking. I'm looking for it. I had to refresh. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what everybody should be doing when they come in is refresh their page and in case it's not coming up. It should come Aaron, up. yes, there we are. Yeah, how about that? And Rob, you're muted. Is that all right? Is that what you wanted? Yay. <laughs> okay, yay. That's cool. How about that? When technology works, it's a good, it's a good thing. Well, that's exciting, actually. So hey, Rob, if, uh, tell me a little bit about your, your book. Has it, um, it's on Amazon now, right? So people can download it? It is, yes. <clears throat> um, paperback and ebook. Yep. Are Please you already getting some part of ghost tracking? Are you already getting some downloads that you can tell or? Uh, a couple. Yeah, actually, um, um, I did a, a radio, I did an interview this week, two interviews this week, and it actually mm -hmm. went into the, the bestseller category on paranormal no books. Kidding. Yep. It, it entered. Okay. That, that means that it, it's within the top 100. That's really awesome. Yeah. So it went in there for a day. It was good. We'll be famous. No, I don't start, it'll launch our new TV show. <laughs> yeah. You imagine oh, who's going to play me? Um, I think. Oh, let's see. Let me see. Who would who would play me if if I didn't play myself on a show like that? Hmm. Let me think. I think it would I, be. I don't know. You talking about actors? Uh, yeah. Children? Matthew yeah. McConaughey. Yeah. He would have to play me. <laughs> people say I people say I resemble Bradley Cooper, so that would. Oh okay. yeah. How about that? My take. How about Nicholas right. Cage? Oh, <laughs> no. I like that. I like that. That's that's kind of cool. I like. Yeah, I can I can I can pull it. I can pull that off. Uh, I don't know. I look like every other British Irish guy on the planet. I think people come up to me and say, "Don't I know you? Haven't I seen you somewhere before?" And I'm like, yeah, I get that all the time. No, um, we just we all look alike. So, all right. So I'm checking out my. I'm going to my. Um, using my iPad over to my left so that I can see, hopefully see the show as it's live delayed. But it will let me then see the chat room. And Margaret, are you going to be kind of watching the chat room? I am trying to get back in there. Of course, my, you know, computer issues again. So Rob, right now, <laughs> it's up to you until I get it up and running. Oh, wow. So, so I don't even know who's in there right now. I am so, taking a look. Looking for how to get into it from this page. Oh, there it in, is. In the meantime, here is the cover of uh, the book. Oh, that's so cool. Case file. It's, it's, you know what got me? It looks, it's, is it going to be lighter? Like when the non-paperback version comes out? Cause you can't see the guy holding the flashlight. This is the paperback version. Oh, you, um, well, on the, uh, yeah, the Kindle cover is a little lighter. Oh, it is? It's just the way that every every book is printed differently, kind of, so. Isn't that something, Hello. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, we have uh, in the uh, in the comment section, we've got Cheryl. Yay, Cheryl. We've got Terry. We've got Pat. Um, Charlotte Krause and Heather Sinclair. Somebody, Somebody Cheryl said there's no sound. Tell her turn her mic on. Yeah, because uh, we're all we're all on. I think I'm checking to see if I can hear us on. Uh... I see the delay. Yep, yep. There's sound. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cheryl. Though, uh, just in case, it's always good to let us know if there's a weird issue. Of course, she can't hear you if she's telling you there's no sound. Oh. <laughs> 
that's that's true so cheryl when we said that if that made any sense i probably just cussed somebody out who understands sign language i have no idea that's what what's so dangerous about that oh i gotta i need to pull up the presentation don't i yes you do that would be about that part yep let me uh hope everybody's having a good friday night it got up to uh, 89 degrees here today, by the way, Troy. That's kind of crazy. It's supposed That's to be 75, but we haven't seen temperatures in the 70s. Let's see, Spirit Talk. There we go. Yeah, I'm, so I'll get this up here in a minute. This going. No comment, Tom. Who's that uh, for severe weather? What's that? Let's see here. It's nowhere. Yeah, not us. All right, so there's that. There's that. Need to shut that. Uh, there we go. All right. So keeping on the time. Good. Three minutes to blast off. So it's kind of cool. So I have my uh, my special tea. Do you see how I did that? It's like I made it just appear out of the blue. It just kind of. Now it's not going to do it. Oh, there it goes. Oh well. Anyway. Yeah, that's pretty good. Wow, that's clever. Yeah. It looked. <laughs> <laughs> the first time it looked like I held up my hand and then the tea appeared. There, there we go. Ah, there we go. So it's um, it's ginger tea with ginger crystals that's uh, really strong. And then I put honey and lemon and all that. It's like the best concoction for allergies and all the crap that's in the air. If you've never tried it, it's amazing. I learned about it when I was in Barrow, Alaska about 10 years ago. And I caught some weird bug when I was up there and I just lived on ginger tea and it kept me going. Fell in love with it. We have some. Ginger tea? Yeah, we have ginger tea. Of course. Yeah. Oh, of course. The <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> That's what keeps I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with a drag name for you one of these days. It's gonna <laughs> the word Duncan Duncan in it somehow. <laughs> Duncan misbehavior. Miss Duncan Miss Miss Duncan behavior. There we go. All right, all so we've right. got about a minute, and then Margaret, I guess you'll introduce us and all that good stuff. Show up sure. Everybody <laughs> knows us. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but you know there could be other people. The fifty thousand other people that are going to watch this show later on won't know you. You know that's the thing that we get most of the views actually uh, after the show when people have time at night and have nothing else to do. Yeah. So this is cool. So we're still in the pre-show, boys and girls, and uh, just about ready to start the presentation that we started. Uh, we did two weeks ago, but the technology wasn't working. And uh, so I, we did the whole thing, just me and hearing Margaret and Tom and Rob in the background. And it was supposed to look like it looks right now with all of us on the screen and this really cool ripple effect behind my head. Um, which is a lot of fun. Maybe halfway through the presentation, I'll turn it into the Brady Bunch house again. That would be fun. So, all right, I think it's eight o'clock, Marg. All right. So, of course, let me start. Hey, y'all. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Margaret. We have Troy with us, Rob and Tom. Um, they are mediums of inspired ghost tracking. I'm the founder. And we are coming live to you on our Facebook page. And Troy is going to talk yeah. about trust. That's right. And I've invited um, these, these three characters from the group to come in and be part of this because um, we've all experienced uh, about half the stories I'm going to talk about tonight. We were all there and experienced it. There were many other people as well. And, people with Margaret, especially who were carrying all of the equipment and all of the stuff that was going on with that. And uh, then Rob and I would come in and do our medium ship investigations. And we'll talk a little bit about that too, because it was interesting is when do you send mediums and seers and all of that into uh, a situation and into the group? Uh, somehow Rob just disappeared for a minute, but there he comes, he's back. I had to fix the background, sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, but it's kind of interesting, and it will, don't let me forget to talk about this, Margaret, the, the point where we have to decide if Rob and I and people, different 
seers and mediums go into a house before your investigation so the investigators have a better idea of where to set up equipment or if it's better for us to go in after the investigations because often Rob and I are stuck because once you connect through trust and relationship with a, a ghost that needs to cross over we want to cross them over right then the opportunity is right then and so we often will do that so you actually go in after us mm -hmm. we've gone in before you before we used to do that but we found mm -hmm. that there was issues with you going in before us um yeah. <laughs> for several different reasons yeah and um so we changed it up and it works very well with y'all going after us i think so too <clears throat> if the ghosts will behave and not ask us to cross them over we could go in first but it doesn't work that way sometimes all right so let me get started um what I'd like to do is this time, um, I'm excited to give this presentation a second time. We've had our practice run uh, a couple weeks ago. Many of you may have already seen that. So much of what you're going to hear, the, the content or the guts of what you're going to hear tonight is the same. But what we're going to do is enhance it with uh, several really cool looking slides. And I am going to start doing that right now. And as soon as I get to share screen, so I'm going to tell you what I'm doing in the text. So it doesn't look like I'm just stammering around, not having any idea what's going on, which is usually the case. Uh, I'm going to start sharing a, a, a start a screen with you, and then you'll see us talking up in the probably the right hand corner uh, as we go. So uh, with that said, I'm going to have Margaret keep me on, keep us on schedule. And what you'll what will happen throughout the presentation is if you have a question um, or a comment, go ahead place it in the chat room while you're watching because we'll, we're watching that the entire time. And Margaret's going to be gleaning that, pulling out of that the questions and comments that we think uh, that you want us to talk about. And we'll, we'll interject that uh, into the conversation and give some commentary on that. I know some of the questions will come straight for Margaret with the equipment especially and then to Rob who is a well-known author now and uh, medium and then his husband, Tom, who is also, I don't know, Tom, do you call yourself a medium rare or you call yourself a medium or? Medium just, medium just starting. <laughs> medium, so medium just starting. He's just, yeah. just on the grill. Yeah. <laughs> that works. He's cooking. So <laughs> That's good. And that, that's the thing. And the thing is, is you've probably been a seer or medium your whole life, I'm sure. And now you're just exercising that ability and it'll grow with the experiences that you have and it will grow in your own unique way. It won't, it, it's funny when people do this, uh, people who are, are go into mediumship or start working being a seer or a, uh, different kinds of giftings, it, it doesn't usually play out exactly like someone else's, not normally. It's, it's very unique and different, just like your DNA. It's like almost like uh, we have physical DNA that makes us all unique in millions of different ways. But you also have, I believe, a spiritual DNA that transcends from generation to generation. It's passed on to you. It's given to you by light and love and God. And, uh, and it's very, very, very unique. And everybody's unique gifting uh, that I'm finding is a unique part of the puzzle that is so awesome because uh, every experience we normally we've had, unless you get somebody that's coming in and they think they're Whoopi Goldberg from Ghost and they start rolling their eyes in the back of their head and asking to be possessed, that's different. <laughs> We don't like that, but our people who come in seriously and sincere about the whole thing and work with us and go through this um, every single time, they offer another piece of the puzzle as we're trying to stitch together an experience when we're in someone's home or something's happening that we're trying to figure out. And they add to that puzzle until finally uh, within usually sometimes pretty quickly, sometimes within an hour, all the pieces come together and it starts clicking and we start trusting each other's uh, abilities and, and different unique gifts that they bring to the table. So it's another part about trust. So with that said, I think that's a, a pretty good gateway to get started with the actual talk. Now, um, as we've gone through this, we've talked about different angles, lots of different angles about what's important when you do investigations, or uh, even if you're not an investigation in your house or someone's house, and you are sensitive to something, you feel a change in the atmosphere, or something doesn't feel right or there's a ghost, or there's a haunting of some sort, it's uh, really important that you don't antagonize and yell and scream at these entities just to see if you can make them move a dish or something crazy like that. Because all you're going to do, these things are operating in a spiritual realm. 
And that's very dangerous and really careless. Can you imagine if um, somebody walked into your house and they weren't invited and they came into your living room and started screaming and cussing and yelling and telling you, would you move a plate? You would look at them like they were crazy and you might move the plate. You're probably going to throw it at them to get them out of the house or you're going to bring a really bad feeling and darkness to where they just feel so awful that they want to leave, that they just want to escape. And that happens sometimes. And I've watched some TV shows where people come in and the last thing on their mind is building trust and relationship in a good way with another human being who happens to be on the other side, who happens to be a ghost or spirit. These are all people, mostly. <laughs> Actually, a lot of them are people. Many of them are animal spirits that Rob deals with. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. But even with animal spirits, there are these loving entities that uh, are still so vibrant and beautiful and can't wait to connect with you from the other side when you're able to hear it or with somebody who can pick up the signs and the symbols. The picture you see on your screen right now is one of my favorite pictures. It's like in the end, only kindness matters. And it, it's this homeless man who uh, has this little, this, you know, this little puppy. Um, yeah, it's a puppy or a lamb, but I think it's a puppy. And just the look on his face and the look in his eyes uh, just got me. It teared me up when I first saw it. He's concerned not only in that picture, um, my take on this story is he's not only concerned just about himself or being cold or all of it, but he, he's out of all of it, he's building a trusting relationship and love that he's building with this other creature that he can feel and sense. Like when we have uh, pets and we have our, our, little, our little guys and creatures that come into our lives and he's everything in his mind right now is how am I going to feed this little guy? How am I going to take care of him? What happens if it gets cold? What if somebody's mean? You know, this is, I need this love. I need that relationship. And that, that really, really gets me because when uh, we're going into a place an investigation, uh, often these are the kinds of entities sometimes that come through. And instead of being distracted by an outward appearance um, and by, by all the trappings of being alive and life and seeing people who are alive and people make instant judgments on people based on sight and all that. In, in spirit, uh, it's harder to do that. And you're often uh, really just connecting to the genuine nature and sensing their spirit and who they really are, which is really a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so this often brings a sense of healing and gifts and, and, and all of that. So I'm going to, there we go. Um, let me tell you, before we get into the stories, which I love, we love the storytelling of these experiences that we've had. And before we get into that, I want to tell you just a little bit about who I am, where I come from. Um, I'll make this fast. It's just that I'm originally from West Virginia. My dad um, and my grandparents on my dad's side grew up in Southern West Virginia in the mountain state. And my dad was a coal miner for the first several years of my life. And he would come home after being in the coal mines and be just pitch black from all the coal dust. Uh, and, and then we did get to see him very often because he was just working, working, working all the time and hundreds and sometimes thousands of feet under the ground digging coal and doing all the stuff that coal miners do. They had a very rough, rough life and a very humble existence. And, um, and there was a lot of uh, love, but yet there was a lot of harsh abuse. And these people were abused beyond belief in the coal mines by the people in those days who were having them dig the coal. These companies would come into the state, buy up everything. And they actually, there's a story about how um, they didn't, weren't even allowed to use American US dollars. They uh, the companies would take all of that money. They, would, they wouldn't allow any stores, normal stores, to come into the areas these people lived. And then they used a type of currency they called script. And the people had to use company money called script, which wasn't worth much. So they were working hard, trying to get all this stuff. The companies taking money from these people, making them use this fake money, like monopoly money that wasn't worth much, to buy just food and clothing. And it made it harder for them. And so these people really did live rough. And there are so many stories of paranormal experiences in West Virginia that resulted from a lot of these people being very unsettled when they passed and when they died, or they have messages and things they want to try to tell their story. Um, often, in my experience, if you can connect with a ghost who's, have, who's uh, been walking through a forest or a house, and it's just there all the time and you can tell they're really upset and they don't know what to do or they're living like in a dream cycle kind of in the world of spirit often if they can connect with someone 
and sometimes just tell their story, just tell you uh, how they died and what happened and who they didn't get to say goodbye to and the circumstances of their passing, that sometimes is enough and the haunting will stop. Uh, and I have a story about that I'll tell you in a little bit. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner is another, and the bottom two pictures is something that I want to investigate more and we'll see if maybe we get IGT to go take a day trip or a couple of days and go to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. That's where you have all the stuff about the Mothman prophecies and the movie that came out about that and all the documentaries. And uh, I, being from West Virginia, we lived uh, just, I mean, close to Point Pleasant, uh, West Virginia, as I was just a little boy. And as a matter of fact, that bridge you see right there in the bottom left is crossing the Kanoa River and it uh, collapsed on Christmas Eve a long time ago, like in the late 60s and killed everybody on, on the bridge. It just fell into, or it's the Ohio, it's a canal. Fell into the river, and uh, the turns out that my dad and I were on that bridge the night before it fell, and he said that everybody knew one day it was gonna collapse. There'd be hundreds of cars going across the bridge and people, and it would just shake and vibrate. And people were really scared to be on that bridge, but they had to get home and go to work. And the state never really took care of the bridge, and, Finally, one day, the whole thing just fell into the river and killed a bunch of people, many of which were in my dad was a minister, so a lot of people in his church were killed that night. Uh, and so there's a lot of, uh, I'm sure, interesting energy around all of that. And that bridge collapsed around the same time as the story goes that every so many years, uh, there's supposed to have been a curse placed on Point Pleasant after an Indian tribe who lived in that area a long time ago as areas were being settled and uh, the French and English were there and they were taking the lands and they were doing whatever and abuse, being abusive to the indigenous people of the area. Uh, the Chief Logan was the chief of the area at that time. And as the story goes that my family told me, um, while he was, they, the, some of the, the settlers came in, enticed him away, said they had some gifts for him and wanted to talk and have a meeting. So he left his village. When he came back, they had slaughtered his entire family and the entire, just killed everyone. And he pronounced, and as the story goes, a curse on the whole area that every so many years, some disastrous thing would happen. And I'll be darned if apparently that isn't happening and it's, going, it's happening. So the bridge was one of those, they think was part of the curse. There was an explosion at a, a chemical plant just down the river from there uh, a different time and other things have gone on. So it's been really, Interesting. Margaret or Tom or Rob, have you been to Point Pleasant before? No. You haven't gone yet? No, no. I haven't been to Point Pleasant. No. No, sir. Because have you uh you've heard the stories about Mothman prophecy and all that as well? Yeah. I think Tom saw the horror movie, but we didn't, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> I know, I know. You know what's interesting though is it's not just they called it Mothman in West Virginia because the people who first saw this creature flying through the air with this huge wingspan that looked had a big head and red eyes and looked like a giant yeah. Mothman. Um, other people I think call it Owl Man, and they have different uh, names for it. But these Mothmen and people uh, appear as it goes all over the world at different times before disaster uh, sets into an area. And so if you start seeing this Mothman creature, might be a good idea to get away from that area for a while. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll see. We'll learn more about that as we go. So I'd love to go there and check it out one day. Now, uh, a lot of my background has contributed to what I do now with IGT. And a long time ago in my former life, I was a teacher and I was asked to go and live on the, uh, well, actually I asked to go because it was part of my teaching experience, live on the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona in the Four Corners area. And I lived there for four or five years. And uh, I met elders, uh, traditional indigenous elders there who were, oh my gosh, talk about knowledge holders and being connected to the world of spirit. There were people who were, had positive energy that were like, uh, I think they called them uh, white medicine men and then dark medicine men, and there were good ones and bad ones. And uh, the ones that were of light performed blessing way ceremonies and help, helped with healing and, and culture. The dark medicine men would come in and manipulate. Somebody could come in and say they hated a neighbor or they really wanted somebody to get sick or die. And those kinds of medicine men would come in and perform those kinds of ceremonies. And I'll be darned if there are so many stories about 
the realness of what goes on out there. Actually, my parents at one point lived in that area and my dad um, had both good and bad experiences. And he had so many stories of running into different entities. And it was amazing, the stories. I'll have to tell you about those one of these days, but there's a legend out there. It's not even a legend, people really believe it. And they, there's countless sightings that Navajo people have of seeing what's called a skinwalker. And these are uh, creatures that are spiritually, spiritual beings that they believe are people and children who are raised to become skinwalkers. And they're trained by certain medicine men to uh, transform into almost like half, half, almost like wolf-like creature or coyote and half human. And they can run as fast as a car and they can go in and take things out of your house so that that medicine man can perform certain ceremonies and things on you. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of story and lore and uh, tradition around that. And uh, my dad uh, actually believed that. He, he saw some pretty unexplainable things while he was out there. And those were interesting to me. So I ended up talking a lot with the elders who trusted me uh, to tell me stories because a lot of people think indigenous people are stoic and that they, they won't talk much or whatever. It's just this terrible Hollywood thing that happened out of the movies. Um, but the people that I met were very careful um, with the knowledge that they shared. In the Western world, anytime somebody knows something, we're taught to go out and share it and teach it and let everybody know. Uh, and people take that information, misuse it, and turn it into something that's not correct and do a lot of harm. The Bible being one. Uh, when the Bi printing press came out and the Bible was being mass produced and going out and to the, to the, to the masses, anybody who wanted to read it, it was at that point, especially, that people started taking bits and pieces out of the Bible and misinterpreting that and making a whole narrative and, and tradition around things that were absolutely not part of what the Bible said, and it caused incredible problems. And um, as much as it caused good for the people who knew what they were doing, there was a lot of bad that happened. Navajo people and indigenous people are very careful with that. So until they trust you and believe that you're not going to misuse the information they give you. They're not going to tell you. And so when you get information from a, a knowledge holder, an indigenous knowledge holder, it's an honor because it, it says more than just, I want to tell you a story or give you information. It means I, I, I trust you in your spirit that you're going to take this and use it in the proper way. And uh, that's such an important thing to do, especially uh, carried from that into the paranormal experience. That's the same that's true with many ghosts and spirits that we deal with. They don't want you misrepresenting who they were in their living life, in their, in their life. If you do, you can get in a heap of trouble and cause trouble, not only for the families that remain, but if that ghost or is really upset with what you said and it was just flat out rude and wrong, um, you know, it, it could have an effect on you. And then, then long story short, I went into Peace Corps and Chad Africa, learned a lot there about the different cultures and religions and then eventually became a teacher and eventually went into technology and education and started working at, at NASA where I met Rob. And that started this whole journey um, of, of working, of going, of, of doing this with the paranormal group with IGT. Hey, uh, Troy, this is uh, uh -huh. Rob. There, there are uh, quite a few questions in the chat. Oh, good. Let's, let's, let's answer a few. Um, <laughs> one of them is can the living possess the dead? Can the living possess the dead? Rob, I've, I've not heard of that. Have you? No, I've never heard of that. Um, no. Uh, we can't, mediums can't control spirits. Yeah. It's more the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way around. It's the other <clears> way around. <throat> what if, an interesting question. I, that's a really interesting question. I like that. Um, that's one of those questions that make you stop and go, huh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great question. And that came from one of our new members, Jennifer. Oh, hi, Jennifer. Pleasure to have you watching this. Margaret, do you want to throw out some more questions? Um, well, the only other one I see is Terry, okay. who was here with us last time, if you recall. Right. Um, and she wants to know what has frightened you the most in your experiences? Oh, that's good. Uh, I can, I can pretty much answer that. And then you guys, of course, answer your scariest moments. I think um, 
before we go on any investigation, um, I do a lot of like the day, days leading up to that investigation. I do a lot of meditation, a lot of prayer, and I pick up what I can pick up uh, remotely before I go. And I, a lot of my praying and meditation is about, um, is this something that I'm allowed to go to? Is this something that I'm prepared for? Or is this something for someone else to do? And it, because if you go to, you put yourself in a situation that is over your head and you're not prepared for, you can get, you can create attachments, you can, all kinds of terrible things can happen. And I don't want that to happen to me or anybody that is on the investigation. So I'm, I'm meditating about that before I go. And then sometimes, well, most of the time, I have a notebook beside me and I start writing down the impressions and, and what starts coming to me about that investigation. Now, before we go on investigations, Margaret is very strict about not telling uh, any of us, especially Rob, especially me and Tom, anything about where we're going apart from where it is. And uh, that's on purpose, it's by design because uh, we really want what we say not to be influenced by what we've heard or tainted in any way. We want it to be really clear. Do you agree with that, Rob? Yes, I, I do. Uh, sorry, I was looking in the chat room. There were more questions, so I was, <laughs> I was trying. Oh, I to... thought you were getting ready to say something. No, no. no. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's where we are with that. So what was the question again? I lost my train of thought. What's oh, the scariest experience. So when that happens, I often start getting impressions about a place, and my, my scariest moments actually usually happen before I go. And I'm, I'm communicating with Margaret and, and Rob and Tom about uh, what I'm feeling and sensing. And sometimes it feels very overwhelming and dangerous. And I'll let them know. I'm like, you know, this is, this is a really dark place. This is, this is some nasty energy. And you, we all need to be covered with light. We need to be ready for this. And there was one experience where I, right up until I went, it was, the feeling was so awful that I wasn't sure I was going to go. And it actually did, um, I did feel, it's not really fear or fright, it's, it's a sense of just anxiety and discomfort that it, it could be a dangerous situation that I'm going into. And I believe that I'm covered by God and light and love, um, but at the same time I operate in wisdom and I'm not gonna do something stupid, knowingly stupid that I shouldn't be doing uh, at any time, especially in the spirit realm. So I had, we had an experience um, it was, it was only about a year, maybe within a year ago. And it was a, a place where uh, I could sense, not only I could sense a, uh, some of the ghost energies that we were going to encounter, but I also sensed a lot of sickness, uh, scratching, uh, shadow figures, uh, and all these impressions, like somebody else's memories were, were coming to me. But the, the dark entity that was there, the dark energy that was there, that was otherworldly was, was so bad that it was so bad that it felt like it was controlling the ghosts and trapping the ghosts that were in the house. And, and that was the energy that had me concerned. And before I went, I had uh, two different spiritualists contact me separately and tell me, Troy, we don't know where you're going and what you're doing, but we just got in spirit, we just got this word that you need to be really careful that this thing knows you're coming and it's uh, waiting. And if you, when you get there, if you're not ready, it's, it's gonna be really, really bad. There was such an urgency in their voices that I was like, oh my gosh, you know, maybe I won't do this one. <laughs> and I told Margaret all about it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know about this, you know? And so the day before, uh, the night before, the feeling that uh, was still, it was all bad, but uh, light and spirit and God energy just came and let me know that I was okay. I was covered and I, took a deep breath, I felt the sense of confidence about doing what I was doing, and I marched into it with that awareness and the seriousness of it. And it was a serious case <laughs> when we got there. It took us, was it three visits? Yes. I think. That's the only that one I've gone back to three times. Yeah, that's the one that Rob didn't go on because of oh. whoever was in the house and all that. And okay. I actually remember we talked on the phone before we went. And I told you, I said, let's go. And if up to the time we're walking in, if you don't feel comfortable, then we'll turn around and go. Yep. But yep. I felt I, I was very insistent. I felt like 
we needed to go, yeah. that nothing was going to happen. Funny thing is, which takes us to one of the questions in the chat room. I was just talking about this to, um, to Christopher, who has a question. And, okay. and I told him um, that there's times when I count on my archangels or I call on them. And that yeah. night was one of them. Yeah. And you said that you saw him there, I the did. big tall one and, you know, oh, which yeah. is Archangel Michael. I always call him in when we feel that we need more help. That was an amazing experience because yeah. when uh, I see in spirit, um, it's, it's, it really is. It's like, uh, I've talked about this a lot. Um, what it is like to me, it's sometimes you can physically see shadows and figures and things like that. I mean, physically see it. But most of the time, you can feel it. It's like such an impression that's outside of you coming in that you feel and sense that uh, your imagination, which is a wonderful tool, starts going to work over time. To try, it's, all it's doing, it's your brain trying to put a picture and image together to give you a visual of what it is you're feeling and sensing in spirit. And so eventually you get really good at separating stuff you're making up versus stuff that is coming in spirit that your brain is trying to process and put together. And you get real images and real flashes of very accurate uh, depictions of things that you can confirm off and ghosts of people with past and Rob's drawn pictures of them. And then we go look for the picture and there it is. And um, there's some really cool stories that uh, we can talk about with that, but that was one of them. And so when the uh, angel angelic being showed up, we had a really nasty ghost there. And I remember asking the angels and the guides who were there to arrest that spirit, to arrest that ghost, and to stop it and hold on to it so that we could process and help the other ghosts that were in the house cross over. And as soon as that happened, we opened up a portal of light, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And there was uh, a woman who crossed over uh, and then the angels, the entities brought the arrested one they were holding on to that had all the energies and a whole process happened where eventually that one crossed over. And that boy, that's a story for a book, actually. That it was, is. That, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Now, I noticed Rob's picture disappeared, but is he still there? I am still here. <laughs> hey, Rob, what was your scariest? Do you have a scary moment? Uh, waking up every morning, <laughs> being <laughs> work. looking in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the wrinkles. Um, <laughs> no, well, I, I guess my my scariest moment actually was uh, on that double murder ghost investigation when we oh, yeah. women were brutally murdered. I mean, that was to me that was shocking and frightening. It was. Yeah, that that was scary, and there's still. I'm still unsettled by some of that, actually, uh, yes. all these years later that we've talked about going back and uh, maybe touching that one again one of these. Yeah, days. I mean, just because of the brutality of the way they were murdered, um, I've yeah. never been able to shape that. Yeah, well, it's funny because when you're when you're a medium and a seer and discernment and you feel and sense, you you feel the way someone died. Like if they share that with you, their final moment. You sense it and you feel it. You feel the fear, the anxiety they had. And sometimes it's really overwhelming. And Margaret and folks have to get busy on us and like shake it off. And they start covering us in light and back yeah. off from it, you know, take a breath. Yeah, that was pretty scary. Um, Margaret, do you have a scary moment before I? You know, I don't think I do. Yeah, and that's good. You know what comes to mind with me is. Um, when we went to my mom's, Troy, and you said that I'm protected and it doesn't look like that's, you feel that's why I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that, I mean. That's right. So far, knock on wood, nothing has <laughs> really scared me to that degree. You know, going to your, it was your mother's house, right, that we went to and and going yeah. to that, that was quite an experience. I, I didn't expect. So again, Margaret didn't tell me a whole lot about that. And I got there and I was getting images and stories the longer I was there that just weren't making any sense to me. And as we pieced it together, it was really cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I've gotten to the point now with Rob's help and Margaret and the team 
that um, it's, it's a leap of faith. It's a step of faith every time you go. You just put yourself out there. You say what it is you're sensing and feeling for what it's worth, and you let it go and let people do with it what they want. They can believe it, don't believe it. Yeah. But you say what you feel and you sense, because, and that's valid because it's very real what you're feeling and sensing. It took me, it took me some years to develop that confidence through practice. And uh, I had to have experiences where I realized what I was sensing and feeling was actually being validated quite a bit and all the time. Uh, I love, by the way, the images that you're looking at all have a background of the star field. That's a star field that I got from like a NASA based uh, website about a, there's a telescope on top of Hawaii or Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And it's this wonderful, uh, it's like Hawaiian and there's several countries, I think, French, Canadian, and, and some other countries that uh, are with this telescope, and they take pictures of a deep field of just a tiny little piece of the sky, smaller than the moon, the darkest region they can find, and they open the aperture for a while, and over a period of several years, they took little tiny pictures, little tiny pixel images of the deep sky and dark regions of just, I mean, literally about the size of your fist if you held your fist up to the sky and just looked, that bit of sky that your fist covers is all they covered. And what came back uh, were over a half a million, not just, not stars, but a half a million galaxies in that image. That means galaxies are filled with billions and billions of stars and planets and moons and nebulae and all of it, galaxies. So the image you're looking at right now with the exception of just a few is galaxies as big or bigger or smaller than the Milky Way that we live in. So I just thought that was, a beautiful kind of background to have in this kind of thing because when, you, when you're connected in spirit, it's not just about the earth. We're part of, we're, we're made of stardust. I mean, we are part of this universe. This earth was created by the materials that exist, which came from stars. So if you ever feel really down and depressed and, and in the dumps and you just don't think you have any self-worth, just go outside at night, look up at the stars and realize that's where you come from and that you are made of the heavens. You are made of light and you're made of that energy and all of that. And you're no mistake because the odds of you even being alive here today on this planet based on all the odds against you ever being alive as a creature on this planet, it's just millions to one. It's insane. And here you are, you're listening to this. And I, I love doing that. It regrounds me in who I am and the power of, of who I am. And when I look at the stars and I see those galaxies at night, it reminds me that we are this tiny little speck in the existence of trillions of other worlds and other experiences in, in the universe. And there's so much more to this existence that we don't know and we're learning. And we, we have just barely scratched what we know about it. And even as much as we know, it's just scratching the surface. And that blows me away. And it reminds me who I am um, and why we're here and where we come from and what we do. And so there's an image that just really describes a little bit more of it. So, and there's some text on there. So later on, for those of you who want to rewatch uh, the show, you can pull that up and take a look at that slide uh, and use any of that. That's just a NASA image, which is really cool. Now, we, you've heard us use terms like seer, medium, all the different words that come up for people who different, extraordinary, fun, cool things. Uh, I, I see myself, I've, we've, I've been called a medium and I, I believe that's accurate for a lot of some of the things that, that I do. But those words are also words that we um, have used different words for the experience in different walks of life and belief systems. And um, I come from a very strong, as anybody who knows me, I come from a very strong uh, church background. And believe it or not, <laughs> this is an interesting one. I, I came from an evangelical background. My dad was an evangelical minister. and. The fact that I'm here doing what I do in the paranormal world and that I embrace all those who are gifted in a multitude of ways um, <laughs> outside of that belief system uh, is extraordinary and miraculous. And I, I'm so, I, I am so blessed that, that I get to do what I'm doing right now because a lot of people where I come from don't. They, they're very stuck in a certain way of believing. And right now, evangelicals, um, um, I'm not going to dog them or anything like that. I'm not going to get political, but they're getting a really bad rap with a lot of the things that are going on in the world. And a lot of it is, is deserved. I mean, I'm watching the same stuff. I grew up with the same people, uh, but a lot of those people um, are not uh, the stereotypical version. Um, and they're there trying their best. 
uh, to help and try to change perceptions and old ways of believing and different things that are just inaccurate and, and awful. And I, I still reach out to people from my community. And I've met, um, in, my, in my experience growing up in that church, I, I gained a lot of what I do from my family, from my dad, his side of the family, um, and my grandmother. But I gained so much more of it from being in those experiences where I was allowed uh, to actually explore gifts that were called different names. And there were gifts of the spirit, discernment, different words that were used uh, for the things that went on. And when I started uh, delving in with Rob into the paranormal world, I started recognizing the same kinds of gifts and things people were using called sometimes the same thing. Many times they were called something else. So a seer is something that um, it actually crosses the boundary in all, in all the, that world and this, the paranormal world. And it's somebody who is, it's a very visual person uh, and there's a description there on the slide that talks about it. Um, you, you're, you walk into a room and you can feel an angelic presence or you feel a ghost presence or you feel good or bad. And you, uh, many of us have that experience where you walk into a place and it just feels wrong. You can't put your finger on it. Sometimes you know it's that person. I don't know why, but it's that person. And uh, you really do pay attention to that. You've learned to use that to, as a self uh, preservation to protect yourself and your friends. And it doesn't mean you go attack that person. It just means that you're very, very cautious around that person until you learn what's going on and what's happening. That's one of the things that crosses the boundaries of many gifts, but the seer will do that. Often a seer will receive images in their head ahead of time. Uh, and that's exactly what I was just describing. Uh, revelatory gifts mingled in with uh, discerning of spirits and con is really cool because um, I, I can really, a uh, gift of discernment is being able to go into a situation and not only know that there is a ghost or sometimes in my way of believing, everybody believes the same way, uh, some really dark, bad energies that could be demonic or else uh, otherwise. Uh, you can sense and feel it and, and know what that is. If any of you have watched uh, Lorraine Warren, like in, in the shows that she's been on, she'll go into a house and uh, like in some of the later shows, and she will start describing what type of energy is in that house, whether it's human or not, and uh, why, why it's there. And she was really gifted with the gift of discernment. And, and it really can be a wonderful, wonderful thing if you are trained how to use it. And that's where IGT came in. That's where people that I grew up with came in. And I still am in touch with spiritual advisors that help me when I'm really confused about some stuff. So this is a slide that I'd like for you all to uh, take a look at as you can. It talks more about the gift of discernment, what that is. Uh, it's a lot of what I've already described. It helps you just understand some of the nuances of it. Um, sometimes it, with that gift, you're drawn to specific individuals for some reason you don't know why. And then the more you talk to them, suddenly you realize you both shared an experience yesterday that no one else experienced and it's a breakthrough for that person because it's a validation for something they were scared about or upset about. Uh, you happen to see a field of yellow flowers that drew you so strongly to it, for instance, that you didn't know why, but you just couldn't take your eyes off of it. And you find somebody the next day whose mother just passed away and their favorite flower and color was yellow. I had a, um, a neighbor who uh, just down a couple houses down from me, and he and his husband had been together for, I think, 35 years. And one of them, Tony, passed away uh, from uh, prostate cancer just about maybe two, three years ago. And um, his partner, John, is still living there in the house. And it, it was just really an awful experience to watch him go through and go through uh, with him. Well, you know, two, three years later, um, I was walking by uh, their house. And I just, this knowing came to me, the sense that uh, something really strong and spiritually related was getting ready to happen. And so I stopped in front of the house and I dwelled on it a little bit. I meditated just a little bit. And I realized their little dog, Rusty, who was super old, he had been there with them. It was Tony's dog uh, who had passed, was uh, really elderly and, and was having some issues. And that I felt like he was close to his passing. Uh, within a day or two. And the next day, um, little Rusty passed away. He just, he walked in after a walk and kind of just laid down on the ground and never got back up. And, and John was getting ready to take him to the vet, but before he could, Tony just passed away. Or not Tony, but Rusty passed away. So John, when I heard about that, I was prepared. 
uh, for it. And I realized that it was John's partner, Tony, that was giving me those impressions. He was like, I, he was basically telling me, Rusty is, was a part of me. Uh, he's somebody that John was holding onto this little dog and at remembering me, connecting with me. And when Rusty passes, it's gonna be really hard for John. Don't let him be alone. This is gonna choke me up. But, um, and I said, well, well, Tony in spirit, I'm like, what would you, what would you like me to do? What can I say that would even begin to help? And he's like, um, he just impressed on me that John's favorite color, or Tony's favorite color was yellow. And he goes, I just want you to go to any store. I want you to pick up a big bouquet of yellow flowers for him and, um, and take it to him and just with a card and just really acknowledge the situation because he's going to feel very alone. And I thought, I, I'll do that. So I told Jeff, my, my partner, I was like, this is going to be sound crazy, but Tony just told me that we need to take yellow flowers to John. And when, you know, boom, Rusty dies. And <clears throat> uh, I went and I got the flowers and I could hear Tony. Tony was Italian. He was very uh, animated. And I'm like, you know, he would just tell you what he thought. And I was like, gosh, I don't know which, there's lots of yellow flowers. Which ones do you want? And he's like, I don't care. Just any yellow flower. <laughs> I pick yellow flowers. He's, and he's giving me this hard time. And so I picked up yellow flowers and I picked up a few other things and I took it to John. And it, and Jeff and I went over and we sat with him, we gave him the flowers and we talked about Rusty and Tony. And it was a real connection for John. It was after the passing of both of them that from the spirit realm, there was not only us talking to them about the people and the little dog of the past, but validation that there was a connection, that there was somebody on the other side and that they cared. And that's, that's where these gifts come in. It's not just to go in and, and, and be really cool and amaze people with, you know, all the stuff that people do. I, I actually feel convicted and bad about that if it even starts going into that realm in any group that I'm in, that people are showing off in any way. I, it, it makes, it decharges my energy. It pulls the energy out of me in that situation. So I have to step away, get back into the realm. I'm here to help. I'm here to help ghost energy, spirit energy, human energy, animal energy. And I need to be there to help these, help these people uh, get through this. And if I do it with that, then God, light, and spirit, all of it starts, starts coming. Now, I'm going to go through these next two. I'm looking at the uh, time. Wow. And I'm going to go a little rapidly through this and get to the story so we can all have a discussion really quick about some of these stories. But the slide you're looking at right now is a, uh, like a Vietnam vet who went to the, the large wall uh, that's in D.C. that commemorates all the people who died during the Vietnam War. He has his hand on the wall, and you can see in spirit the, the ghost energies from the other side that are coming through and, and talking with him, uh, and, and he, he feels and connects. So keys uh, to getting messages for me are going in with a helping attitude, connecting uh, to spirit with the right energy level, with no judgment and trust and, and all of that. And I would imagine, Rob, that's very much the same for you, uh, that uh, when you go in, your attitude that you have when you go into a situation is paramount. Is that, would you agree with that? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, because uh, we've had experiences where we've gone together into a situation and I have been in a bad spot because I had a bad day or Rob was in a bad spot and had a bad day. And we'll stop and we will bring ourselves into the right energy of spirit <laughs> so that we can connect and be of help. Because if your energy is, you're angry, that's a different level of energy that just misses the level of spirit energy where all the good stuff happens. It takes you away from it. It really is like a hierarchical level of, of energies that I'm starting to experience in my life. Um, things that I sense are, um, let me move some of these little slides out of my way. There we go. Things that I sense and how they communicate. I can walk into a place and I will feel the atmosphere of the room change, or I'll be in a situation with some of the stories we'll talk about and suddenly it feels like somebody moves up to my left or right side from behind me and the atmosphere of the room becomes cold and icy or warm with love. And I, that's when I pause and stop and start connecting because that is a clue that spiritual energy is flowing, something's changing, and we need to pay attention because uh, that's one of the real telltale signs for me. Um, so a close presence, emotions and feelings. I'll start feeling very emotional or I'll start feeling some anger or some happiness or giggling or 
sternness or staunchness or any of the emotions that we have, I'll start feeling a real strong sense of that, which lets me know not only has the atmosphere changed, but now I'm actually feeling the emotion. I'm connecting to the emotional level of this ghost or spirit. And it's gonna become part of the story we're gonna we're going to tell and we're going to figure out uh, of what's happening. It's part of the narrative that begins to happen. And then um, I'm very aware of all five senses, uh, all five senses when that we have, most of us have, um, especially sight. We become very acute visually uh, and looking around to see any changes and shifts, uh, looking at equipment, looking at changes in people's countenance, uh, seeing ghost shadows and figures move the house, you name it. And we're very close to that. Hearing um, the, the equipment that we use where they have the recorders and then you can amplify the sound and hear uh, energy. It takes a lot of energy for a ghost to communicate and it can be very faint outside of the human normal hearing range. So with equipment, you can actually, you can hear uh, often the feedback coming from the ghost world and it's amazing uh, when that happens. You ask a specific question and they'll answer and, it, and you're just like, oh my gosh, they, not only do I feel them here, but there's proof they're talking to me and this is what they said. And it matches what you're hearing in spirit, which is really cool. A lot of us have, we'll smell. We've, we've been in places where we'll smell suddenly cigar smoke or we'll smell oranges or we'll smell certain uh, types of flowers that were important to someone who passed. And we bring that, we write that down and we bring that into the narrative. Uh, and then of course, taste, uh, you really do. Sometimes you taste blood if it was a violent situation uh, but you'll also uh, have different sensations of taste of the foods these people like or what they experienced in the passing. And then a lot of times uh, you, will, you will have a sense of touch and that happens, that happens a lot. So we'll be standing there talking uh, and you'll just feel like a light brush right across your arm. It's almost like they're just touching the hair. Uh, one time it felt to me like I was walking through cobwebs and I realized it was an entity touching my arm. There were no cobwebs, there was nothing there. It was a very clean office building we were in. And uh, that was one of the first times I started really paying attention to that. So that's kind of the way we start sensing a lot of uh, what we feel. And then the things I sense, uh, as I said, were one of these, I think it went backwards on me. So let me see if I can make it go forwards. Okay, uh, so seeing in spirit is like for me often it's like seeing a memory with full emotional impact that isn't from you. It's nothing that you have ever experienced before and you start talking and being very uh, vocal about it. And by most of the time, most of the time, uh, it becomes validated. People start, you realize that that is the story of the place. And so you keep going in that realm. If you're off track, which can happen, uh, you start trying to figure it out yourself and you pollute the pool of what's coming to you in spirit. I stop trying to figure it out and I keep letting spirit energy come in and tell me the story as, as opposed to me uh, thinking I've got it. Until, until we know the pieces and the parts and you, you're in with another medium or two that you can confirm what you're feeling and sensing, uh, you're very careful with what story you're getting ready to tell from what you've sensed because you can really be wrong based on uh, a lot of different circumstances. It can be uh, something that you're feeling and sensing brings you back to a memory of your own of something in your childhood and you think that's why you're feeling it and you bring your memories and your experience into it which are off and it's wrong and the more you do it you realize you know when you're doing that and uh, you you have to be very comfortable with shifting and moving in order to stay on the proper uh, with the proper narrative. So um, with that, I think, Margaret, do we have what, maybe 15, 20 minutes or what time do we stop? Um, I don't think we actually put an ending time. Okay. But um, I'd say, you know, another 15, 20. Okay, I think we can get through some of these. Um, one story that was about trust was with my grandma. So the picture you see in the bottom right hand corner uh, is a woman with, and that's my grandfather to the right and that's little me uh, right there, mini me right there in the center. And my grandma Goodwill was the most gracious, amazing, sweet woman I've ever met. Um, she's just, just full of light and energy, a very spiritually powerful, astute uh, woman. And when she passed, I happened to be all the way around the world. You know, I joined the United States Peace Corps at that time of my life. And I, I was uh, in Chad, Africa, actually. 
living in a little hut. And I got word that uh, my grandmother died and I just went into just grief. And at that point in my life, I've been in Africa for a little while and I lived in a very intense and very hard situation. I was in my twenties and it was overwhelming the types of things uh, that you deal with there. There was like plagues of cholera and, and different kinds of diseases that would wipe out people in the village and um, living conditions there were really tough it would get up to 120 degrees in the summer and no air conditioning. And you just lived in a grass hut or a mud hut that heated up it during the day and it stayed up in the nineties at night and then inside the house would be even hotter. And it was just hard, you know, I was going through all kinds of experiences and I became numb um, and it was kind of traumatized by some of that. And I was afraid at one point I couldn't feel anymore. I don't know if any of you have ever been that, to that place through trauma in your life to where you just feel like your emotions are gone. And I was really worried about that. I'm um, like, gosh, I don't feel anything. I don't feel love, hate, nothing. I'm just dead inside. And uh, it was really scary. And when I found out my grandmother died, um, you know, I grieved, of course, I missed her and I couldn't be there. And within a day, I was playing some music that happened to be from Enya. It was this beautiful music. And I uh, can't remember the name of the song now, it'll come to me later. But uh, I I remember sitting in, my, in Africa in the hut and I just felt this overwhelming tidal wave of love just wrapped me. And there was no way I could escape it. It pushed right in and woke up that covered part of my heart. And I knew it was my grandmother. And I knew she was saying goodbye to me and she wanted to give me a passing gift. And it was to feel and to love and to love deeply. And uh, I just lost it. I cried for three days, <laughs> almost nonstop. It was so beautiful. So later on in my life, uh, when I came back from Peace Corps, uh, I went to my grandmother's graveside. And it was weird. I didn't feel her there. I didn't feel a thing. I don't know if you've experienced that going to a graveyard, but you usually people cry and they feel their, their loved one because the physical, what their remains are there. I didn't feel anything. And I felt guilty. And I didn't say anything to anybody. And we went back to my, my uh, great aunt's house, my grandmother's sister, who is the house in the upper in the middle there, a little farmhouse in Ohio near Marietta, Ohio. And uh, she went upstairs and said, Troy, I have something for you. And it was a quilt that my grandmother had made just for me before she passed. And it had a note in her handwriting about how much she loved me and that this was a gift she wanted me to remember by. So the quilt, of course. And when she handed it to me, I felt my grandmother's presence all over it. And it just broke me down. It was the most loving, wonderful experience to feel her that strongly again with that gift, it was so tangible. And then I realized later on now with what we do, uh, often when you touch objects that people have an impression on, there's, there's a whole realm of experience where uh, different people that are gifted different ways, uh, they can pick up keys of somebody who passed or a cup or a hat or whatever it is and impressions come. That doesn't happen to me all the time, but it did that day. And later on in my life, um, I had a whole coming out experience, which was, intense. And as I said, I came from an evangelical household. So you can imagine what it was like when their pastor's son came out as gay and, and all of that. And it was the last thing on earth I wanted. I chose to be straight thousands of times. It just didn't work. <laughs> it just wasn't who I was. If I had a choice, that was a choice I was trying to make because I was raised to believe that was wrong and I was going to hell and, and all of that. And uh, so my mom, when I came out to her after Peace Corps and after her mom had died, and, um, I, and I came out to my parents over the phone because it was a couple weeks before Thanksgiving and you're never supposed to come out on a holiday. It just ruins a holiday sometimes for families. So I thought, oh, a couple weeks before I go be, visit them, I'm gonna talk to them on the phone. Well, my dad had been camping in a mountain, up in a mountain somewhere in Colorado and this presence of light and God and spirit just overwhelmed him while he was up there. And in his spirit and all of it, I think even auditorially, he heard that your family's okay, you're taken care of, it's going to be fine. And he knew something was up. So when he came down from the mountain and went home, I had already come out to my mom who had completely fallen apart like I had died. And my dad was strong and resolute because of what he heard in spirit. He's like, Troy's gonna be fine, he's our son, we love him, we always will. And for the next several years, as we helped my mom through this experience, um, my dad was there strong with me and I thought coming out would kill him and my mom would be the strong one, I was wrong. So with lots of help and with our family, we finally got through it. Now, 
the reason I'm bringing this story up is because the picture in the upper right under the word the dreams and messages, there's a picture of a house with a white picket fence. And my mom told me that when she was a little girl, she and her mother would daydream about living in a, in a house that had a white picket fence with flowers that they could, they could just love and enjoy. And that was their perfect experience. Well, my mom had a dream uh, a couple of years after I came out to her that she was walking in an area and she saw my grandmother at, in that house, actually out in front near the stairs with digging around with flowers and whistling like she did. And she turns and looks at my mom's like, hey, Linda, she's like, I see you. I'm so glad to see you. I've missed you so much. And she said, somebody else is here to see you. And my grandfather, who had just passed, uh, came out. Hey, Linda, I'm like, it's so good to see you. We miss you. And my mom was just enraptured in, in seeing her parents again. And finally, they said, we have someone else uh, here to see you. And she heard my voice. Hey, mom. She goes, but you didn't come out onto the porch. I didn't see you. I just heard you. And the message to her in the dream was, uh, I was, I was okay. That this whole experience that she thought was a disaster was okay. That I was actually going to be fine in spirit. That God still loved me, and that I, you know, all of the all of the goodness of all of that was still very true. And it, so that was something that happened to Mom. At the same time, I had a dream uh, where I lived, and I dreamt that I was with my family. We went, we were just traveling. And stopped at a roadside motel to stay that night. My grandparents were there and we were all going off to our different rooms. And as I was going upstairs in the elevator outside, an outside elevator to the second floor, my grandmother just stepped in real quick and she was stately and strong and taller than she had been in life. And she just looked at me with this loving but stern look. And she just said, be patient with your mother like that. And I said, oh, okay, grandma, I will. And it was because of this whole experience. So I did, I talked to my dad, I became patient. And when mom and I put all of this together, it was changing because of the trust and the love my grandmother shared with us. And we trusted her enough that in spirit, she could talk to us and counsel us from the other side and help us through this really traumatic time in our family's lives. So for that, I'm forever grateful. Um, so with that, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanna talk about portals. Now I've talked about how in certain experiences, portals will open up and we cross certain entities and ghosts and presences over. And that's very true. I never started doing that until I started working with IGT. And uh, we had a few interesting experiences where I, I didn't even know about portals until I experienced uh, one for the first time. And, uh, you know, Margaret, can, <laughs> this is a story about the ghost in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Would you tell us a little bit about how that started? Because that was my first meeting I think I ever came to where I met you guys. Okay, so that one was that Inspired Journeys, which is our first place that we met. And um, okay. so I think we went on break. And um, of course, I went to, to the ladies' room and I'm in there by myself, but I feel someone in there with me. I'm uh -huh. hearing somebody. And it's like, you know, there's nobody here, but there's somebody here. So I went out and I think I said something to Rhonda. And then Rhonda pulled you and Rob in there. I think she said something to Rob and Rob pulled you. I don't remember how it worked. And, um, we took y'all in the bathroom and that's when you sensed it. I know. And so there's Rob and me and Rob were in there. There was a talk going on. And I remember when I sat down in that group, I, I, I gauge the audience anytime I go anywhere. And like a lot of people tell me they do the same thing. And you can, you sense the energy of the room and the people. And my energy was drawn to two women. I just over to the side and I'm like, that's odd. That's like, and I felt like there was something extra about them, like a presence with them. I couldn't figure it out. And uh, so when you called us out of the room, uh, Rob's like, come on, Troy. I'm like, <laughs> who are these people? And then uh, we, we go out. And uh, then when I see you standing by the door of the women's bathroom, I'm like, oh, this is getting really weird. <laughs> and, and so uh, Rob and I, he's like, I, I, I knew Rob, so I was trusting Rob. And 
and we went in and uh, right away, um, Rob, you started picking up the woman that was in the restroom and the, the ghost energy right away and started feeling all kinds of stuff. Can you describe that a little bit? Um, I seem to remember that she was very distraught and she was looking for right. um, an infant that she gave birth to and um, she apparently died giving birth. Mm -hmm. So she was looking for that, that baby. She was. That broke our hearts. And while Rob was pulling that part of it out, I could feel, suddenly I sensed her strongly. And the way I connected to her, and Rob and Margaret didn't know this was happening, neither did I at first, but uh, I experienced something that I guess some people might call channeling. Um, uh, really, it was one of the first experiences of that for me, but I, it never, and I have to, I have to be cautious when I use that word, because I don't want to give the impression that I opened myself up to receive a ghost into my heart or into my body. I didn't. There's, I will never do that. But um, that, that is sacred territory. You know, it's just, that's not to be done. And so, but what I could do is I could feel her emotions and her, I could, I could hear her thoughts and her emotions and what she was feeling. And I started speaking from her point of view. I'm like, but I'm cold. I'm scared. I don't know where she is. And, and finally, when Margaret's kind of looking at me with that kind of like, what, oh, what's going on here? And then she's like, oh, Rob, he's, he's picking her up. This is her. And uh, I remember that. And I was like, God, I'm so glad because I was so into that moment. I couldn't stop and explain it, uh, what was happening. I'll never forget that. I never had had that experience. And I finally targeted where she was. And she was actually down in a section of the bathroom in almost a fetal position, terrified. And the, as the story goes, as uh, we were picking up different parts, Rob could actually feel the physical pains that she went through as she passed. And, uh, and when she passed, not, you know, during childbirth, that meant she, she died, but she didn't know uh, what happened to her child. And for some reason, she got stuck. And for, for ghosts, in my, in my experience, people wonder, like, well, why wouldn't they know that the baby crossed and went to the other side? I mean, they should know everything when they're and they cross, but often they don't. It's almost like living in a, if, you, if you've ever had a re, reoccurring bad dream and in the dream, everything is very real to you. And for some reason, you're walking through the same house again, or you're experiencing the same car wreck again, over and over, uh, or the same, whatever it is, the same trauma. And you have that dream over and over. It's, in my experience, it's very much the same way for certain ghosts who get stuck and, don't cross. They're stuck in this narrative that it's like a bad dream and they can't get out of it. And when somebody who's psychically connected and gifted or attuned to it have really exercised that can connect with them and that ghost can trust you and you can build a trust with them. They know you're there to help. You'll start getting information and lots of information from them. It's just like they're just blabbermouth telling you and feeling everything they can because they're so desperate for someone to hear them and to help them understand what's happening to them. And so Rob will start picking up different emotions and energies of sometimes two or three different ghosts. And I'm picking up the ones of other ones. It's almost like they pick who they're going to trust, isn't it? And, and they connect to that person. And then we start talking from that point of view of whichever ghost we're connected to. It's just incredible when that happens. And by and large, at the end of that experience, we were able to talk with her, this ghost explained to her what happened. And she had attached herself to the two women that I had identified in the group and actually was an attachment who followed them, I believe from a hospital or a, a nursing home or wherever it was they had been. And this woman related to them in some way and followed them. She just was desperate for help and attention. And they were going to a paranormal group discussion. So likely these women had some giftings of their own and it allowed this attachment to happen. A lot of people don't know they even have an attachment but they did. And so when we identified her and we talked with her, we opened up, I'm gonna start sharing the screen again so I can show you in spirit uh, what we saw. And so um, in just a second, this little screen will pop up and you'll see it. Now, portals, uh, the way we do it and the way I learned through this team is uh, you meditate, you sometimes are in a circle, you're holding hands and you start calling in and envisioning love and light. And you picture a little tiny speck of light like that center picture right there in the middle of the screen, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the circle on the floor or in the ceiling. 
but all of us envision that and we, we picture what that looks like and you can start feeling that light. Now from there, the portal will take on any number of shapes. Um, sometimes that light will just grow and grow and grow and be this spiky, beautiful like star light that's right in the center. And as you talk with the ghost who needs to cross over, um, they're ready to go. You open a circle, boy, they boom, they're gone and we're done. And it, it, it's really fast. Other times, um, as I, we describe what's happening, you will feel in the room as the portal opens, what feels like water, um, like spiritual cleansing water just starts lifting up in the room around your legs. It actually is warm and comes up all the way up into the room, like up to your waist all sometimes. And, and it, it has ripples in it, like the picture you see on the right, the picture that's behind me in my background. It looks like ripples in a clear pond. And that ends up being the portal that the energy will go through or the ghost energy will go through. Other times it looks like the, some people will see a door open. I don't think it's rare that I actually see a physical looking door in my experience. Uh, I, I don't think I've, a lot of people have talked about that and that's valid. It's just, you know, I see different portals. The one that I see most of the time is either the water portal or it looks like the one in the bottom, the purple one in the middle, right at the bottom. And it, that spot of light that you see in the picture, the blue picture above that starts. And as it grows, eventually it's like a tear or a rift opens up in that light. And it's, it's just like suddenly it's this rift that I can sense and see in spirit through that portal. And at that point, to help the ghost that's trapped or wants to cross over, we often, when the portal's open, uh, we're like, is anybody there? Like, is your mother there? Is, is a child there? Somebody you know? And we, we really meditate on that and concentrate. And you'll eventually feel that mother or that child or that friend or the trusted loved one or an angel, an angelic being, peek through. And it's something, it's someone that the ghost who's trapped knows and trusts. And when you can let them know that that is them and they're not here to take you to hell. They're actually here to help you cross over. Um, then, and we, you know, then they, boom, they'll go through and after a little bit of time and trust and work, they will touch hands. In this case, the woman that was uh, scared that was in the bathroom, and, um, she finally believed us that her, her child had crossed and was on the other side that she needed to go. And if I remember correctly, it was a, a female it might have been her mother or grandmother that was holding the baby and uh, on the other side and is still in baby form. So she'd recognize the feeling in the sense that it was her, her child. And when this woman saw that, just this flood of crying and emotion just overwhelmed me. And she saw it and she slowly went to the portal and we kept telling her it's okay. And as she did, and she shifted her focus from us, shifted it on to the people on the other side of the baby she stepped into the portal and as the baby was handed over to her arms and she really embraced being on the other side, the portal began to slowly close and boom, it was gone. And right at that moment, the, the air wasn't on in the room, in that room, but this warm flow of air just washed through the room. And all of us were just blown away by, by that. And that was my first experience with this group of, <laughs> of a portal. Rob, when you see portals, is that, do you have the same experience? Does it look like that to you in spirit or what do you see? They always look like, um, like points of, of light <clears throat> or just rounded doorways, like a sideways hurricane kind of. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, I guess so. That would make sense to me, uh, which is really, really a swirl, almost like a galaxy. I should have a picture of that because uh, that is truly sometimes the way it works. Uh, or the, Margaret, I know you have a lot of experiences about portals that open that look like that. And you've learned how to close those. Uh, uh, I know that I've, I've had the experiences with y'all, with the portals. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of our, what was it, a year ago, maybe a year and a half, mm -hmm. when I learned to close them. And I brought that to the table so that um, others could help close it. It was a, that scary experience. I told everybody about the scariest one for me. Uh, Margaret was there and had learned there were like four or five portals that had been opened in that house. 
and we identified every one of them and Margaret helped to guide us through closing uh, those portals. We all worked together on it. And as I would, I would sense one and we'd all go over and she would help us close it. And it, it was really cool. It is really that experience of closing those portals, identifying them, finding out we had portals we had to close was part of the mystery. We had to figure that out. Um, yeah. And then the ghost energy that needed to be crossed over, um, that was really dark. Um, that all changed it. And that family had been sick. I mean, all of them were sick. Even the dog, yeah. I think the dog died. The dog um, died, yeah. Oh, it was just so brutal. And uh, from what I understand after that experience that we had happened, the house changed, the portals were closed. And uh, I think they're okay now. I don't I haven't heard anything back that they're... She has not contacted me. I mean, she contacted me a couple of times right after uh -huh. her to say that yeah. you know, everything was still good. But she uh, has not contacted me in a while. You know, that's uh, it's such a good thing to me and us when we hear that that it is when the house has been cleansed or the portals closed and whatever's going on, that it stays that way is what we yeah. hope for. Uh, because often uh, people, if it's something where they're dealing with Ouija boards or energies, you might have a teenager or someone in the house who's really fascinated with ghosts and they keep inviting these ent entities back. You know, they have gifting of their own. And even after it's cleansed, everything's normal, everybody's fine. You know, several weeks later, it's all starting up again. And it's not that it wasn't closed and cleansed, it's that somebody there or something uh, is still opening it. And in this case, it wasn't the people, it was the portals that hadn't been closed that kept inviting the energy back. So that was, that's always like a really interesting uh, experience when that happens. Um, all right, so we have just a few minutes, I think. <laughs> and I keep saying that, but there's so many wonderful things. And if we can't get to all of these stories, you can go to the one we did before. And I think we did have a chance to get through them. But there's a story of West Virginia, uh, the town, one of the towns I lived in. And the house on the right is an old Victorian house made out of railroad ties along the railroad in Petersburg, West Virginia. One of my best friends owned it and restored it. And when he was restoring the house, um, it well, it started some paranormal experiences, which can often be the case that if you're in an old house and you start restoration, suddenly people start experiencing ghosts and weird things because it, the, the ghosts who live there don't like it sometimes uh, that you're changing their environment or their house and destroying stuff that was theirs and throwing it out and putting something they don't like. It can cause all kinds of interesting trouble if you're not respectful of it. Um, if that, if you've experienced that or that's happening in any way, one of the tricks I've learned that you can do is uh, either with a seer or medium or someone, or if you're attuned to try it yourself, um, try to make sure that the entity that you're sensing and feeling who lived there uh, knows that you're not there to destroy the house. You're actually there to make it livable and you love the place. That's why you live there and that uh, you really appreciate what they've done. And save something from the of them something that um it could be a, a a piece of cloth from the curtain it could be some banister or a piece of wood that's intricate or something from the house save it and give it a special place in the newly renovated house that looks just like it was as a symbol of respect that i really do care about you and i want to remember you this way and i, I respect you and often that can help in this case um i went there and i was my the buddy of mine, he and his wife who were renovating the house, they were gone that night and I was coming in the night, late that night to uh, just see them and stay. And they weren't coming in until the next morning, but they said, Troy, you know where the key is, you know how to get into the house. And so I went in and, and there's a little mailbox next to the door, got the key out and all the rackety sounds of that. And then uh, as I opened the door, I heard a little slight jingling and I'm like, oh yeah, that's the old fashioned doorbell that you would turn, it sounds like a little bell that you turn as a doorbell, and it would rattle, and you could hear the faint jingling of it as I opened the door. And um, I walked in, I went up the flight of stairs up to the room at the top of the stairs where I was to stay. And I went in and I you know, got ready for bed and I went to sleep. And that night I had this really powerful, vivid dream that uh, there was a young man somewhere in his 20s who uh, lived in that house. And he just came into the room and just sat down in the room and was talking to me about his life there and how, you know, how, what, what it was like and, um, and that there had been a house fire that didn't burn the house down. It almost did, um, but it, the smoke from the fire was so bad that he died from smoke inhalation and then in his sleep in that room and everybody else got out, but he died. 
And he was just telling me about it. I was like, oh my gosh, it's awful. I'm so sorry. I mean, you were so young. And, and uh, he was pleasant about it. And then he, you know, he left. And, and then I heard jingling and the doorbell that woke me up about, it was, I looked at my clock. It was about 6 a.m. <clears throat> and I thought oh, it must be Jeff and his wife are coming in. And I heard somebody walk up the stairs right past my room. And I'm like, hey, Jeff. And nothing. I didn't hear anything. I'm like, he just can't hear me. And I went back to sleep. Uh, two hours later, I was awakened again by the same series of sounds, much louder. And the doorbell was really loud and the, up the stairs. And I was like, hey, Jeff. And he's like, what? I was like, uh, why, why are you, did you leave? I mean, why did you come to the house twice? He's like, I was didn't come to the house twice. It's the first I've been back. He goes, get ready, come down, we'll have breakfast and tell me about it. So I did. And he said, uh, so what? <laughs> I told him what happened. He goes, oh, you heard the ghost. I'm like, what ghost? And he said, yeah, ever since we renovated, we've been, we just, we know there's ghosts and we hear him walking through the house all the time, up the stairs, right past your door. We didn't know who it was, but we always hear it. We used to think people were bringing food to the house and, uh, and nobody would be there. And he, I said, well, um, I had a dream and I described the dream, told him about it. He goes, he just got this shocked look and puzzled look on his face. He's like, there's no way you know that story. I'm like, what story? And he goes, the house did catch fire. There's still burn marks behind the walls uh, from that. And this young man in his 20s who was in a room right where your room is now uh, died. And um, we've been hearing him walk. I guess that must have been him. And, and I said, wow. And then after that experience, we never heard that man. We never heard the ghost again. And the moral to that was <clears throat> he just needed he just needed someone to hear his story and validate, you know, I died. He wanted people to know that he was around and then he crossed over and we never heard from him again. It was that simple. Uh, we're not gonna have time to go into all these other stories, but if you go, uh, Rob has a book, uh, which book is this in? Pets in the Afterlife, Rob, that the story about my dog, Pete is in that. Okay, yeah, I think you're still muted. Okay. Yeah. I am, Pet yes, sorry. <laughs> It's Pets in the Afterlife 1. It's, uh, it's this cover right here. That is, that is so cool. That is so cool. Yeah. I told Rob that story when I first met, actually reacquainted myself with you. We were having lunch and he didn't know I was, I was involved in all this medium stuff. And I didn't know he was a medium and I didn't even know I was really. I just knew I had certain giftings. And we went into the story about, for some reason, about my dog Pete who had died, got killed by, by a car. Uh, the first year I went to college and he was 12 years old. I had that dog. He was my best buddy. And there's a whole story about how as I went to college, I detached from him because I had to give him to my dad. And I, I was in a place in my life where I couldn't emotionally, when I lost someone or our family moved off in every three years, it seemed I would lose everybody in my life and I'd have to start all over. And so I got really good at shutting my emotions off for people that I was going to lose, which was really negative and bad. And that happened with my dog, Pete. And when Pete died and was killed, I carried the guilt of my disconnection to him. He was my best friend. And I felt like I abandoned him. And I, for years, like 20 years, I carried the guilt and never had an, I didn't have a pet. I didn't know that was why. I didn't know I'd felt that. And as I talked to Rob, Rob started uh, just really tapping into spirit. And he said, uh, Troy, don't be surprised if you don't start sensing your dog, Pete. And I'm like thinking Rob's crazy. <laughs> And I'm like, that's nice. Thanks. That's really sweet. And so when you know, on the way home, uh, I smelled hay in the car. My dog was a beagle. And he lived in a little dog house with lots of hay to keep him warm. He was an outdoor dog. And uh, I could smell the hay in the car. And I was like, oh my gosh, it smells like my dog. And I'd forgotten about that smell. And then I, I could feel him. I could sense him coming in. Now, here's what got me. And there's a bigger story to it. Uh, when he came into the car, he wasn't um, mad at me. He wasn't angry or standoffish. His tail was wagging. His, he was so excited to see me and that I could sense him that his unconditional love, it didn't matter that I, I was the one carrying the guilt and all the anxiety of it. He didn't. He loved me just the same. And he was happy that we were back on good terms. And, and he was in the car helping me with that unconditional love. And it just broke me. And Pete visited me like that several more times. Uh, over the next several years. And there's a wonderful story uh, Rob included in his book, and I really would encourage you to go to it and see it. And uh, 
uh, with a couple just highlights of stories that are in the previous talk and version of this uh, that we did is of a woman who's at a conference that Rob and I went to. Her son had passed and I sensed his son. Uh, he came up right when I was talking to her and I described him and she just was like blown away because I described exactly what he looked like and why I was there. And uh, she later on talked about that encounter at the end of the conference and she said she'd gone out to her car. There's an emotionally you know, it, it really does a lot, works on your emotions when you connect to a loved one that passed. Went out to her car and her cell phone just started going crazy. And it started rifling through images and pictures. And it stopped on the image you see in the right hand side of the screen. Um, and it says, never give up. And that was a message that she and her son used to share back and forth with each other before he passed. And bright yellow and letters, and it just floored her. It floored me. I, we were all blown away that her son was able to do that, use enough energy to affect her phone. And she came back in and was able to tell that wonderful story for us. And it, it was so beautiful. Um, at the end of this, we did talk about the woman in the bathroom. That was good. We yep. talked about uh, uh, the, uh, there was a, there's a story, there's a couple stories that uh, I really encourage you to get Rob's new book. Um, and Rob, there are two stories that I pulled out of that book that, that really, stuck out to me of our investigations. And as we close, I'd really like, Rob, could you tell us just a little highlight from each of those, the, the spirit dog, grandmother and burn ghost, and then the mystery of the steelworker ghost, maybe a little highlights, a little bit about that book, because I want people to go download that and read all of the stories, but really focus on these two. Uh, well, um, let me just tell you that uh, we didn't expect, you know, we never know what to expect when we go into a house. Um, and every house is different. Um, the Steelworkers ghost chapter was um, interesting because it, it's about a, a ghost that found his way to a home uh, south of Baltimore. And he found his way to a home because he had two sons when he was alive. And the, this particular house had uh, two boys in it. And there was a connection. There was a, a similarity which drew him to that house so um i'll I, I guess i'll just leave it at that the um yeah. the, the other one the spirit dog grandmother and burned ghost was all three things in one place we went in not knowing really what would find other than possibly the spirit of a dog and that was uh that was the only investigation that igt took a, a dog on and that's it was right actually our dog Dolly and mm -hmm. Troy and Tom and I were in uh, in my truck. We came in my truck with Dolly, and Dolly um, Dolly was able to prove exactly who it was that that the sure actually the family dog came back in spirit. But um, the burned ghost was interesting too because um, it was about a ghost that followed a woman home from a hospital, and we can't say what hospital. Yeah, but. Um, uh, we had to cross her over and we actually found out who she was we found out her identity um it of course in the book i had to leave her last name off um for mm -hmm. privacy reasons but um all the other information is in there so those are just two of the stories but uh rhonda's famous picture by the way from the mud house is in the book in the back oh, cool. you can see the shadow of um dr mud coming down the stairway that's really cool could you hold that do you have the book there can you hold the cover up and uh, they can go to Amazon, I think, and get it. Or is that where you yeah. go? Or it's uh, case files and inspired ghost tracking. It's nine ninety nine in paper, and it's three ninety nine on uh, ebook. If you don't want to wait for the paper. Um, okay. Yeah. And Margaret and I and uh, several members of the team, Rob sent the chapters around to us and and got all of our edits and uh, additional information from us to make it as accurate as he could. Um, and if and you included Rob, everything, it would have been yeah. like an encyclopedia size. So, <laughs> yeah. I uh, I wanted I just want to show you that uh, this is the way Rhonda takes notes. This is Rhonda's book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! And I had to go through all of that too. So I've never seen that. <laughs> yeah, it's quite big. Um, oh, it's smokes. got all of Rhonda's I've information. Not all of them. All the evidence. Well, for what uh, in that particular volume, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, there's a That's lot. That's amazing. Of but it, yeah, it was it was a lot of work putting this book together. But um, <laughs> and again, every case that we've been on together has been different, and uh, you'll learn a lot. 
the, uh, so just give you a quick shot at what what you'll see you'll you'll find ghosts earthbound ghosts you'll find mm -hmm. spirits who have crossed over uh you'll find poltergeist activity you will find residual entities that is uh, not intelligent entities that can respond to questions but impressions left upon by emotions um you'll you'll read about ouija boards and how bad they That's are right. and all the stuff they caused mm -hmm. um and we'll take you to historic places and private homes so all kinds of things and even a walk you know, about baltimore i that, love that i love that and I, I was just glancing quickly we didn't have a lot of time and we will we will respond to questions later that were in the chat room that we didn't get to uh and we'll have some discussions there there's some pretty good interesting comments and there's one in particular that i will address uh after the show and, and talk i thought it was a really interesting comment and it was about uh different belief systems and uh and people believe certain things rob and i uh we there are a lot of things that we gel 1000 percent on there are a couple different things that we we have varying beliefs about uh where we are and what we believe in. and that's totally cool i mean i learned from the navajo people that i lived with and the elders there that you can actually hold divergent points of view at the same time you do not have to choose one um, and that's a very powerful place to be. And just because you you acknowledge the way someone believes and you have your own belief, that's that's as far as that needs to go sometimes. And you can really see them both. And it is perfectly normal and okay. You do not have to say, oh, we got to figure out which one's the better one or the right one. You don't have to do that all the time. You can really live in harmony uh, with a whole lot of belief systems. But the, the particular point was some people don't actually don't believe in ghosts. And, um, and are coming to paranormal groups and don't believe in uh, that kind of ghost energy. And I, I, I don't know if this is what they, they meant to say, but I do have a lot to have a wonderful conversation about. And it's not me trying to convince anybody about how I believe, but um, in the belief system I grew up in, um, a lot of those people don't believe in ghosts either. And there's a real strong belief that it's not a ghost uh, that you're feeling, <clears throat> that you're being fooled by a demon. And uh, or by some other ghost. No, here's the thing that I want to tell you about that and my experience with that. I, my experience has brought me to believe in ghosts strongly. Uh, and I also am somebody who have, I do recognize dark energies that I, uh, I call it demonic forces. People have different names and regions why they think those dark energies exist and, and that's all valid. Um, there are times where you get a really dark energy uh, that tries, and it does this to people, it will try to mimic a friend or mimic somebody that want, that um, that you want to be your friend. And these people will have an attachment of a dark energy that they think is their friend that slowly destroys their lives because uh, its its whole goal is to bring you into its level of energy. It just wants you to be there. It's, it's, it's like a parasite. And it makes you believe that it's a really nice child ghost or somebody that's going to help you and gives you tips and tricks. But if you start noticing that person or your life, if you're doing that and you have a, a type of energy, a spirit that you ghost that you think is your friend, uh, some people do. It can be your grandmother and that can be very wonderful and like a guardian angel kind of character in your life. That can be a wonderful thing. Uh, but if it's, a, if it's a false one, if it's something that's mimicking and it's, its goal is to fool you and destroy you, if you start noticing that your life, you're angry all the time, you're, you're getting sick all the time, the, you, you do not see life the way you did before, it's like a type of depression starts happening and it doesn't get worse. And you start noticing that your friendship with that entity is getting stronger and you become so reliant on them that you trust it 100% as the more desperate you get, the more you trust it. It takes a lot of work uh, to untangle yourself from that spiritual bond that you've created with something that's very, very bad. So uh, I think that might be in the realm that, that this gentleman was talking about or the person, and I, I totally get it, and I understand uh, a lot about that. So I'd be happy to talk with you later about that. And there are a lot of really good comments and questions, and if we had five hours, we'd go into it all the time, but we don't. So Margaret, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for having me on, and letting me screw up the technology two weeks ago so that we could do this again <laughs> and make it work this time. Well, on final notes with me, let me just kind of add on to what you said. Um, we're a large group. Even our core group is very large. And we all have our own opinions and beliefs. 
but we all respect each other's and we find the best way to do what we do with whoever's opinion that it is. You know, there's right. no right or wrong way. That's so true, Margaret. And, and that's the, the whole thing about being non-judgmental is paramount in a group like this because we all come from places where we have been judged, especially people with gifts that are psychic gifts or paranormal gifts or spiritual gifts of any kind. Uh, You're often mm -hmm. um, kind of put down and ridiculed for that, depending on where you come from. That can be a really rough experience. So when you come to IGT, um, we work hard uh, to make sure that everyone is respected and everyone is safe and that it's a safe place for you to experience whatever gifting that you have. And if we don't have the answer for you, uh, we sure as, sure as hell are gonna look hard to help you find the right book or the right person or the right people uh, to be with to help you grow your gift because that's part of, I think, it, I don't know if it's one of your direct goals, but it certainly is a secondary goal of what ends up happening with IGT. It happened to me. I uh, developed and grew into who I am right now because of my experience with this group. It really, truly, I do attribute that to uh, being with you guys and you giving me the opportunity to grow and learn in my gifts. And then I just can't believe where, where we are with this right now. It's exciting. Yep. We pulled you in the ladies room and you never left. I never left. I'm like, if they're that crazy, they're my kind of people. <laughs> that was so much, gosh, I can't believe that. Oh, That's well. right. Rob came in as a guest speaker and never left. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I loved it with your with your husband, Tom, uh, as he's tiptoed into all of this with you. Uh, I love it when he goes with us on these investigations because he he has like Rob's a scientist and, and Tom, an architect, and, and does all this. And so when we go in, um, what Tom really helps us with is he'll go through and if there's like something wrong with, uh, like you feel real bad energy or you feel like whatever, and people are getting sick in a certain part of the house, he'll check it out and see if there's a big power circuit or a bunch of wires or how the house is set up and what physically might actually be happening that's dangerous for that the people in that house and often identifies that and we know it's not paranormal at all or it could be connected in two ways but uh, we're able to uh, deb debunk uh, any paranormal experience in the house because of something physical that can ultimately save people's lives uh, if you find something like that's going on. So yeah, that's been fun. And then he's also intuitive as well. And he's picking up all kinds of really cool energies and it goes into the puzzle of what we put together. And uh, I love it. I value it and I, I can't wait to do more. Once COVID is over and we can actually go into people's houses again, uh, I'm going to believe it's going to be over. Uh, we can do it. Do it. Well, thank you again. And Margaret, do you guys have any closing words before we end? That's it. Thank you guys for watching. <laughs> And thanks everybody. It's been it's been wonderful. And uh, please let us know uh, your comments. Let us know if you like this kind of talk and if you learned something from it. And share your experiences. I'd love to hear them. And and we really do pay attention. So, all right. With that, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Good night. Good night.